And so now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you the one man on this earth who needs no introduction anywhere. And that is the one and only, the man who has, can, and will make America great again, Donald J. Trump. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Thank you. And there are a lot of people outside. They can't get in. But would anybody like to give up their space? I was going to say seat. There aren't too many seats here. We have, uh, we have a full house times maybe three, because outside you have another couple of houses full of people. We love them. And we're providing audio for them outside. But I think you have a better location in all fairness. Hello, South Carolina. I'm thrilled to be back in this incredible, beautiful state with thousands of proud, hardworking, God-fearing American patriots. That's what you are, American patriots. You know, the last time I was in this arena was a time, very good time in a sense. The country wasn't doing well. By the way, compared to today, it was doing great. You know, we had a border problem, but that was like a peanut. We solved that problem pretty quickly. That was like a peanut problem. Remember, I came out, I said, the border, they're having problems. They've got rapists. They've got thugs. They've got this. And everybody said, what horrible things. We were right about that one, too. What we said was nothing by comparison to the fact, but what we have now is a total disaster. This is far, far worse. And you know, we solved that border problem. We solved that border problem, and in 2020, where well, we got millions more votes, by the way, just for those that are interested. But, but we solved that border problem, and uh, I said, let's talk about the border. They said, sir, nobody cares about the border because you've solved the problem. I said, no, don't they want to listen? So I talked about the border. Nobody cared about the border because we solved the problem. But we were in here at the beginning of 2016 in the same arena in January of 2016. Think of that. And uh, so I guess it's a lucky arena. And we're going to see if it's lucky or not. We're going to see if it's lucky or not. 
because they steal and they cheat and they do a lot of bad things, but we're going to win this. We're going to win it bigger than ever before. There's never been a more important time. Tomorrow, you will cast one of the most important votes of your entire life. And honestly, we're not very worried about tomorrow. We want to aim toward a time called November 5th. That's what we need, November 5th. Got to beat crooked Joe Biden, if it's going to be him. I don't know if he's going to make it to the starting gate. I don't know about that, Henry. Is he going to make it to the start? Henry would know. Has he been a great governor, by the way? He's been great. That was a big part of the equation. I said, I'm going to move her out, make him governor. I like that. And I did you a big favor. But we're going to have a gigantic victory here in South Carolina. We're going to show crooked Joe Biden and the radical left Democrats that we are coming like a freight train in November. Right? Nikki Haley is relying on Democrats and liberals. You know, Democrats are financing her campaign. Crazy. It's called the crazy world of politics. No, the Democrats are financing her campaign. One of her biggest supporters is a radical left Democrat who made some money with the Internet. A very uh, bad guy, actually, but he's a Democrat. And those are the ones putting up money because they damage us. The biggest supporters she's got right now are the Biden supporters, the Biden bundlers, the Biden cheaters. They're the ones that are doing it for Nikki. So if you don't want the ultra left to meddle in this primary, and I think they're going to try and end it, who the hell wants Democrats voting in a Republican primary? What is that about? What is that about? Don't worry, you're going to swamp them. You're going to swamp them. It's important that we do. By the way, it is. It's important. We're going to do great tomorrow, but it's really important you get out and vote because we want to send a signal to the real, the real hardline people, the people that are destroying our country, Joe Biden. We're going to send them a signal that we're coming. We're going to send them a big. So get out tomorrow. If you don't feel well, don't worry about it. Get up, get out. If your husband's not feeling good, darling, I'm just not, just get him out of bed. Don't worry about it. He'll be okay. Get out and vote. Tomorrow we're going to win this state, and then we're going to tell Crooked Joe Biden, you're fired. Get out of here. You're fired. You know, it's amazing. There is more spirit now than at any time anyone has ever seen in any campaign. You know, we're nine months away. It's not like, gee, we're going to vote tomorrow. Tomorrow's your big day. You're going to vote in a primary tomorrow. But the big day is November 5th. There, nobody has ever seen spirit like this. This is like, for some people, think of it. Nobody would have a crowd like this anyway, even if it was the day before the election. But this is like the day before the election stuff. The saddest thing is we have nine months to go, and the kind of stupidity and destruction that they have and can cause is, is just mind-boggling. So we have to just hope that this time flies, because we have to take over. They're going to destroy this country. We're going to end up in a world war. We'll end up in World War III. They'll destroy our country. We have to get out. We have to win. Under the Trump administration, you were better off. Your family was better off. Your neighbors were better off. Your communities were better off. And our country was far, far, far better off. That's for sure. America was stronger and tougher and richer and safer and more confident. Think of it. We've lost our confidence as a country. How about that? You know, I've said that in a lot of speeches. We've lost our confidence. What a horrible thing to a tribute to our country, that we've lost our confidence, and we will. We have no leadership. We're not respected any place in the world. But I'm more confident than ever that we will soon be sitting behind that beautiful, resolute desk in the Oval Office, and we'll bring it back quickly.
Because together we built the greatest economy in the history of the world. It was the greatest economy in history. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. With the biggest tax cuts ever recorded, bigger than the Ronald Reagan, and we like Ronald Reagan, but we beat him out on the tax cuts. The biggest, the biggest regulation cuts, the record energy production like never before, and rising wages for Americans of every race, religion, color, and creed. Never did so well. We never did so well. Under crooked Joe Biden, it's been three straight years of total economic warfare and welfare and stagnation on working American families. Think of it. They had essentially 39 percent increase in inflation, 39. So think of this. No matter how well you did, you didn't do that well. That means you fell behind the eight ball because the inflation that he caused primarily because of his stupid energy policies, windmills all over the place. Let's put up windmills all over. Let's do, you know, windmills. It's the most expensive energy anywhere in the world. You can't do more expensive than wind, aside from the fact that they kill they kill the birds, they kill everything around them. You know, it's the Green News scam. It's part of the Green News scam. But they had, think of it, a three-year inflation rate essentially at about 39, if you include everything. They like to say, well, we're not including food, minor things like rent, food, energy. Under my leadership, you had virtually no inflation. Under Crooked Joe, you had energy prices reach the highest level in history, the history of anywhere. That's a good idea. What a, we'll be here for a while. Let's just enjoy it. Sit down wherever you can. Whoever has a seat, sit down. That's, I'm very honored. Don't worry, you'll be standing up soon. You'll be standing. You know, speaking of standing up behind me, I just see them. These are incredible women. I don't know about the husbands. I don't know what's on with the husbands because so this is, I, I think it's about the 115th time. And they come from, they come from a place that's not too far away. You, you do like North Carolina, right? They come from North Carolina, so it's, you know, they travel to Texas, California. Oh, there they are. There's some more over here. There's our husband. Finally, I see our husband. But these women are unbelievable. They love our country. And at least for this one, they didn't have to travel very far. So that's very nice. And then over here, we have Front Row Joes. I think it's 125. I don't know what they do. I know they're rich. But I don't know what they do, but we love all of you. You're great, you're great American patriots. Thank you. And by the way, the Vietnamese delegation, I don't know what it is about Vietnam, but they do like me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we like them. Thank you. They travel me. They travel with me all over. You know, I must be too soft on Vietnam because you like me too much. <laughs> you like me too much. Thank you very much. I agree. They want freedom. That's right. Under Biden, gas prices have reached five, six, and even seven dollars a gallon. In some places in California, they've gone up to eight and nine dollars. Three years ago, under my leadership, we had energy independence, and we were soon going to have energy dominance all over the world. We we're going to be dominant. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any other country. Think of it. And we don't know what we're doing with it. I had gas prices at $1.87 a gallon. Wouldn't that be nice? Thanks to Bidenomics, the three-year mortgage rate has hit a 22-year high, with the average mortgage payment at a brutal 3300 and $22 a month. Nobody's ever had, they've never had numbers like that. When I was president, the average monthly mortgage rate was nearly 50% less. In fact, we had numbers at 2%. We had a period of time at 2% and it never veered much from that. You were saving $19,000 a year on your mortgage. 
And while Crooked Joe likes to brag about the stock market, the stock market is up just a small percentage after you deduct and adjust for inflation, which is setting records. What we're doing with inflation. And by the way, after the election, and we can't say this because much bigger problems, our country will be destroyed if we don't win this election. But if perchance they won, you will see numbers on energy, the likes of which you've never seen before. They are doing, you know, they're pumping it as much as they can under the Trump. They're saying, keep it going. Let them keep going. Let if this election ended as a failed election or a rigged election, and I say the only way it can end where they win is a rigged election, because what they did in 2020 is disgraceful. And look, and look what happened. Look what happened to our country. You have wars that never would have taken place. Russia would have never attacked Ukraine. Israel would have never been attacked. You wouldn't have had inflation. It was all caused by the energy. But by contrast, under my leadership, the stock market was up by an astounding 62 percent with inflation almost at zero, 62 percent. With your vote, we will vanquish Bidenomics, which is a very negative term. You know, he heard the term. He loved it. Oh, that's good. No, that's a really bad term. It didn't work. And we will reinstate Maganomics. That's right. Maganomics. You guessed it. And we will bring our country back from hell. Our country has been through hell. When you think about what happened in Afghanistan, all the things that took place, it's our country's, our country's been through hell. We're laughed at all over the world. Crooked Joe is now pushing a $6 trillion tax hike. $6 trillion. This will be the largest tax hike in the history of our country. Maybe in the history of the world, I guess. And if he wins, that's what's in store for the hardworking people of South Carolina, a wonderful state that we work so closely with, with Henry and everybody. And uh, we had it to a level that it's never seen before. And now it's never going to be quite like that. It can't be, but it's just going off. You know, the stock market is up. Many people, some of the smartest people in the market, say it's up because we're leading Biden in the polls by so much, and they expect that we're going to win. If we lose, you're going to have a crash like you wouldn't believe. If we lose, that's an incentive if you have stock. If we have a tragedy happen on November 5th, it would be a tragedy. In the opinion of many, and in my opinion, you will have the largest stock market crash we've ever had because a lot of the stock market, because the only thing that's doing well is the stock market, and it's doing well because the polls are all showing that we're winning by a lot. So we gotta, we got to make sure we win. And if we win, you're all getting the biggest tax cuts because we're doing additional cuts and a brand new Trump economic boom, a boom like you've never seen before, not even in our great four years. When I was president, we slashed taxes for working families. We doubled the child tax credit. Not a very Republican thing to do, but I said, let's do it anyway. That was something that we wanted to do, and people are very happy about it. The mothers, the families, they're very happy. We did something that we really felt we should do, and we supported moms and dads by dramatically expanding education savings accounts, which is a big deal. Use them. Under my leadership, the Republican Party will always support the creation of strong, thriving, healthy American families. We're supporting America first, a little thing called America first. We want to make it easier for mothers and fathers to have babies, not harder. You know that. That includes, and you saw this, it was a big deal over the last few days, that includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America. You've been seeing, you've been seeing Alabama. It's been a big story. Like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republican, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious little beautiful baby. I support it. And today I'm calling on the Alabama legislature to act quickly to find an immediate solution to preserve 
the availability of IVF in Alabama, and I'm sure they're going to do that. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life and the side of mothers and fathers and beautiful little babies. You have to be on that side. IVF is an important part of that, and our great Republican Party will always be with you. We're always going to be with you in your quest to find that ultimate joy in life. You know, the ultimate joy in life is a beautiful, healthy, wonderful baby. So we are with you, and I wanted you to know that. And a lot of Republicans call me. I put that message out on a, a thing called Truth Social. Has anybody been tuning in lately? It's hot. Truth Social is hot. But we put it out a little while ago, and a lot of people called up. A lot of politicians called up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, that's the way we feel. So we're going to be with you all the way, and uh, you're going to see things. We want to we wanna help. I mean, it's a very big subject, frankly, very complicated and very big. But we're with you all the way, and I think there are a lot of happy people in this room. Most of you know exactly what I'm talking about, but thank you very much. Most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Crooked Joe Biden is not the only massive tax hiker in this race. You also have a person. Oh, she's so bad. She said, I will never run against our president. He has been a great president. He is one of the greatest presidents ever. I will never run. I promise you, I will never, ever run. Three years later, lady, lady, how about that? Three years later, he goes, she goes, Ladies and gentlemen, I've decided to run now. What happened? Do you ever see the clips? We have about 12 clips. I will never run against our president. He is one of the greatest presidents ever. A uh, little bit later. No, no, don't use the name bird brain. That's not. No. Please, please, madam. Please, madam, don't use the name bird brain. No, we got to win this. We have to win big. We have to show, you know, again, supported by the Democrats supported and funded by the Democrats. Republicans aren't supporting her. They don't like her. And they don't like her policy. She's essentially a Democrat. I think she should probably switch parties. You know? Probably she should switch parties. But you have a Nikki Haley who tried to double your gas tax here in South Carolina. Remember, she said, that's not true. But then we put up clips. We put up clips. No, she tried very hard. And she also supports a 23 percent national sales tax, which basically equals election death. You know what that is, right? You can't get elected when this stuff comes out. And you think they treat me bad, and they do. They're horrible people. These people are sick. They're sick. I've been indicted more than Alphonse Capone, the great guy. It's true. I got indicted. My parents are looking down. They're saying, I never thought this could happen to my son. He's been indicted. I didn't know what the hell the word, and, I, and it all took place in instantly. If I fly over a blue state, the next day I get a federal grand jury notice, please report. And they indicted me on bullshit. It's all bullshit. But remember, if any other person were in this position, they'd be treated the same way as they're treating me. I don't think that's harshly. I think they truly hate me more than anybody that's ever lived, you know. It's all because we won an election, 2016, that we weren't expected to win. Now, I expected to win it. All of you expected. We'd go to rallies, we'd have 50,000, 52,000, 68,000, 101,000. We had our rally. And they'd go to rally and they'd have like, like in the case of Biden, he'd have eight circles, beautiful little circles. And they'd have to use the media to stand them because they had no people. And then you hear, oh, they won just by a little bit. They just ounced us out. No, that's a crooked, it's a crooked deal. But Nikki Haley, if she were ever in this position, they'd go after her. I could tell you about five reasons right now, but I don't want to get myself in trouble. Also. They'll say, he's so mean. He's so mean. Oh, there are some reasons. I think everybody in your state knows some beautiful reasons. They would go after her the same way they go after me. That's what they do. Because they're basically a party of 
misinformation, disinformation. They lie, 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 and they say it like Russia, Russia, Russia. Took me two and a half years to get that one off my back. You know, that was, that was a real crooked deal. They used that as an excuse why beautiful Hillary, I call her beautiful, because I've taken the name Crooked Hillary off, I've given it to Biden, because I had sleepy, I had sleepy Joe Biden, I have Crooked Joe Biden, I think Crooked Joe is more accurate, you know? Although sleepy's, sleepy's pretty good. Nikki Haley is not in this race to fight for you. She's in the bidding for big donors, or maybe she wants to get a contractor on CNN. You know, they, did you see their ratings? Uh-oh, there go the CNN cameras off. Why did I do that? Ah, oh, I shouldn't have done that. The light just went off. They knew what was coming, right, Tim? They knew what was coming. No, they have the worst ratings they've ever had. The thing is dying. You know why? Because they're not truthful. They're not truthful. They're really not. By the way, did Tim Scott make a great speech? Huh? Yes, I will. I don't know if he likes it when I say this, but it's so meant as such a compliment because he's such a fine man. He ran, and he ran okay. He was okay. He was okay. He's a respected guy. But he ran, and he did fine. And then when he got out, he endorsed me, and he's a surrogate. He's the greatest surrogate I've ever seen. This guy went from modest, high-quality man, introducing his mother, who's incredible, by the way. But I said, Tim, Tim. I said, I called him up. He took everybody. He had like five of the worst human beings interviewing him, trying to hit me. He said, Donald Trump did this. He did that. He did criminal justice reform. He did the. And by the time he finished with them, they just wanted to get off the set. And I said, he's a much better representative for me than he is a representative for himself. And it's true. And that's a great compliment. And you know why? Because he's a high-quality person. He doesn't like talking about himself. It's true. It's true. I love that. No, I came into arena three weeks ago, big arena. You know, we won in Iowa in a record. You know, Nikki, this guy, Nikki, she loses to Biden in virtually every poll. She talk, She has one poll that's so old now, the paper is turning, and nobody ever heard of the poll. She loses to Biden in all the polls. But forget that. This guy, I want to get, he's far more interesting. So we won, we won Iowa in a landslide in a record, the likes of which has never been seen. In fact, we took the record and they doubled it. We won by that margin. We then went to New Hampshire. We got more votes than anybody in the history of New Hampshire, the New Hampshire primaries, which they've been around a long time. And I heard Nikki today said, well, yeah, I lost two. No, she lost four, because she lost the Virgin Islands, which she tried like hell to get. We won that, too. A lot of people don't know that. But then we went to Nevada, and she was campaigning against candidate unknown. It was candidate. Candidate unknown was me because I was in the caucus, not in the primary. She should have been in the caucus too, but she didn't want to be because of the poll numbers, which were terrible. I got 99.6% of the vote, 99.6. And then in the primary, the candidate unknown, which probably I think people thought I was the candidate unknown, beat her by 60%, beat her. But she said she only lost two, but that's, and she's going to have a very bad day tomorrow because she's not a nice person. She's not a nice person. But we were in Iowa and then in New Hampshire, and I saw this big, we had a big arena like this, and I heard the people going crazy, and I heard some guys screaming, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. I said, who's that? They said, it's Tim Scott. I said, 
That guy's unbelievable. So anyway, well, we love Tim Scott, and you're lucky to have him in your state. All right? Right, Henry? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. It was a great honor. Actually, it was a great honor to — that was one of the a few endorsements I wanted to get, and we did get it. And it's a great honor to have it, Tim. We appreciate it. And he did a good job today also, by the way, because I heard that one, too. So Nikki's gone, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I have to — I guess I have an obligation. I mean, we have an election tomorrow. Uh, front row Joe's, I have to at least mention for a couple of seconds, right? Then we're going to get on to more important things like how to make America great again, okay? But Nikki has actually gone very far left. She's very uh, rude. Do you notice that? I don't like to say that, but she's very rude. But because of her Democrat donors, she's working for Democrat donors, and all she's trying to do is inflict pain on us so they can win in November. We're not going to let that happen. We're not going to let it happen. And she's not really attacking me. She's really attacking the Republican Party, and that's not a good thing to do. So a vote. For Nikki Haley tomorrow is a vote for Joe Biden this November. That's all you're doing is you're voting for crooked Joe Biden. A vote for Trump is a vote to fire crooked Joe and put America first and make America great again. That's what it is. And the reason they're fighting so hard for Nikki is that the radical left Democrats want Nikki Haley because they know she's easy to beat, and all the polls are showing that. She's the easiest one to beat. She's much easier than Tim would have been. She's much easier than many of our good Republican candidates would have been. She wants to gut Medicare and Social Security. You know, she wants to raise the retirement age of Social Security, and she can deny it all she wants, but she wants to raise it by 10 years. And she gave land away to China, and in the recent amnesty bill, Nikki sided with Joe Biden and the open borders maniacs, while I sided with the American people. I like that much better. And as I told you before, or at least indicated, I gave her the job at the United Nations 90 percent for one reason, because I wanted that man, Henry McMaster, and maybe more importantly, his wife, Peggy, to be the governor and first lady of the great state of South Carolina. And they have been unbelievable. They have been unbelievable. And just in uh, finalizing it out, but this, because this is kryptonite, Mitt Romney is kryptonite. You know, a certain senator, a very, very good senator, I'll mention names, but I backed him, and he took a tremendous lead. And then time went by, and three months later, I said, by the way, how's he doing a certain great state? And they said, sir, he's up by 40. And then 40 points, that's a lot. That means it's over. And then a month went by, I said, everything okay out there? No, sir, he has, he's actually down by two points. I said, he lost 42 points? What happened? Well, people said he was friends with Mitt Romney. I said, Mitt Romney is kryptonite. You can't be friends. So I found out it wasn't true, and I went on I went on a rampage. And we ended up getting him elected. He won quite easily. We had to convince people that he was not friends with Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is a disaster for the Republican Party. And now he's gone. You know, we're getting rid of a lot of these people that are so bad. And you remember the clip? when she was at a podium, and she actually was with Romney and somebody named, I'm sure you haven't heard of him, Barack Hussein Obama. Have you ever? <laughs> right? Barack Hussein Obama. You ever hear, remember Rush? Rush Limbaugh, the great Rush, can never be replaced. <laughs> Sean Hannity told me that he can never be replaced, Rush Limbaugh. But he used to talk about Obama. He wasn't too friendly to Obama. But he'd always introduce him, ladies and gentlemen, Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> he would scream that middle name out. And we do miss Rush, don't we, though? We gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, right? <laughs> Mr. Wall over there, stand up. The nicest suit I think I've ever seen.
Remember, I built 571 miles of wall, and we were going to — that's far more than I said. We had the safest border in history. Now we have the worst border in history. But uh, every time I look, he's at a lot. How, what number is this for you? Ah, uh, well, we love you, man. It's great. You're great. Right. It's in the hundreds, I believe. It's a lot. That he's probably like a very successful professional guy. I'm going to find out. But we have fun. It's like these guys come to football games. They're solid, solid citizens. And then they come out in, you know, gear and names all over the football. I say, what's going on? But in his case, he's not rooting for a team of football players. He's rooting for America, right? Right? So if you want a president who puts America first and defeat Nikki Haley, you got to go out and vote. Got to send the signal tomorrow. Got to get up. Got to vote. Fire Crooked Joe and elect your favorite president, Donald J. Trump. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. This is a hell of a nice arena. This is big. Upon taking office, I will end Joe Biden's war on American energy, cancel his ban on exporting American natural gas, and we will quite simply drill, baby, drill. We're going to drill. I will revoke China's most favored nation's trade status, and we will impose stiff penalties on China and other trade abusers. They are a tremendous trade abuser. I got along with them very well, but a tremendous abuser. Remember this. No other president did anything, nothing to China. They would walk away with $509 billion a year. It's, it was just a terrible. I took in hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes and tariffs from China. We will once again live by the maxim of the Trump administration, buy American and hire American. And to protect South Carolina workers, I will pass the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act. You know what that is, right? If China or any other country makes us pay a tariff of, let's say, 100 or 200 or even 300 percent, and they do that, we will make them pay a reciprocal, identical tariff of 100 or 200 or 300 percent right back. It's called, you screw us and we screw you. Very simple. As tariffs on foreign countries go up, taxes on American workers and families will come down very substantially. You know, last night, uh, I was making a speech in a very nice area. I was going, and we were in Tennessee, and a man came up to me. He owned a big uh, metal company, collects metal and manufactures metal. And he had tears in his eyes, strong guy. You can see he's lifted plenty of steel. But he came up to me, and he said, sir, I just want to thank you. You saved my life. You saved my company. My company was ready to die in 2016. And then you put up those tariffs on China steel. They were dumping steel all over the place. I was dying. All the steel companies were dying. Wow. <laughs> must be, she must be in the steel business. But he said, he said that, uh, he said what you did was so incredible. And I saw him in the audience when I was speaking. That was before. And I said, would you want to come up here? He said, yeah. And he got up and he was in tears. He said, uh, what you did with the tariffs, I put a 25 and a 50 percent tariff on steel coming in. And it totally saved his company, saved the industry, and a lot of other things. A lot of very good things happen because they want to put you out of business, and then they want to have a monopoly on steel and lots of other things. It's no wonder Joe Biden and his thugs are so desperate to stop us. They know that we are the only ones who can stop them, and they know that. That's why they are weaponizing law enforcement for high-level election interference. That's what they're doing right now. It's all — look at Fani, F-A-N-I. It should be pronounced Fanny. Fanny. Fani. Fani. They say she gets very upset if you call her Fanny. F-A-N-I. 
She fell in love with the person that long before this started. He got paid almost a million dollars. He never did it before. They love to talk about disinformation and democracy. They talk about disinformation. They talk about threat to democracy. But they're the threat to democracy. They use the DOJ, the FBI, our election systems. They rig our elections and attack free speech. Isn't it amazing? All the people that go and get investigated, all of them, all of them, they don't go after the people that rig the election. They go after the people that want to find out who it was that rigged the election. It should be the opposite way, and we're not going to put up with it. Joe Biden and the fascists that control him are really the true threat to democracy. Those are the threat to democracy. All of this persecution is only happening because I am running for president and leading very substantially in the polls. Now, if I wasn't running, again, cases coming out of nowhere, all run by DOJ, the White House, even a DA case, local DA case, they put the DOJ top people into the local DA's office in Manhattan on a case that's absolutely, in fact, Every critic and every legal scholar said, it's not a case. There's no case here. But they put DOJ people in there. It's weaponization. And, you know, at least I have a voice. I can speak about it. And the poll numbers go up because when people hear about it, they say, wow, never been done in this country like that before. But if they hit a congressman or if they hit even a senator where you don't have that voice, where you can stand up and discuss it with millions and millions of people, they will leave office. They will go back home to their family. They'll make a speech that I will fight for my name. I will fight for my name. I will go home to my family. And you never hear from the person again. It's never been where you get hit with something like this and you go up in the polls. Usually when you get hit, if a, if a regular, good, strong, wonderful politician got hit with a federal subpoena or a state subpoena or any of these subpoenas, they it, — it's — it doesn't matter whether they're innocent or guilty. They have to resign from office in disgrace. They have to. With me, I got hit, and my numbers went up. I am sort of freaky. It's freaky. And I don't mean went up. I mean went up a lot. Because people get it. They see it's a scam. It's only been done in third world countries and banana republics. It's never taken place here, never like this, but it's okay. I have so many lawyers. Lawyers are my best friend. And you know what I do? I campaign in the day when I can, and when I can't, I campaign at night. I go to courtrooms, and we're doing very well. We're doing very well. It's all a big scam. It's a big, fat scam. In the latest morning console poll, we're at 81 percent in the Republican primary, and we're dominating Crooked Joe in the general election. We have a poll. We have a poll where we're at 91 for me, 7 for Nikki. I guess you have, you have a couple of points undecided. Who are the people that are undecided? We have one of the biggest and largest margins ever. You know, it's, it's tough. A Republican has a tougher path, actually, because the Democrats, like a friend of mine called up, they said, I see you're up 11 points, Washington Post, 11 points on Joe Biden. He's not a political person, but he's a very smart person, made a lot of money, very successful. He said, how come you're only up 11 points? You should be up like 40 or 50 points. The guy can't put two sentences together. He can't walk off a stage. He can't find the stairs. They're all over the place. He can't find stairs. So this guy, being a novice, said, how come it is? Why is it that you're only up 11, sir? I said, you know what? You don't know much about politics. We'll take it. In fact, our lead against Biden is the largest that we've ever had at 6 and 7 and 9, 10, 11. And we have won at 14 points. That's a lot. The radical left Democrats rigged the presidential election in 2020. They rigged the presidential election, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election of 2024. Thank you. Thank you.
Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it actually a great badge of honor. That's a little different thinking up there, isn't it? But it is what it is. I'm being indicted for you. That's what's happened. Never forget, our enemies want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. I will never let it happen. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. I just happen to be standing in their way. Thank you. It's true. So we're delighted to be joined by some incredible people and uh, people I talk about all the time. So I don't have to go through a big deal here because it's your favorite governor, Henry McMaster, and First Lady Peggy. Peggy McMaster. And Tim Scott, I want to thank you, Tim. I love Tim. We know that. Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. And we have a lot of members in Congress and from Congress here. Some are in the audience, and I'm a little bit, oh, I'm going to get in trouble because I won't be able, I don't know where the hell they are. And, but we, I do know some of them. One is Mike Collins. Mike, wherever you may be, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Great job you're doing. A superstar with a tremendous future, Byron Donalds. Where's Byron? Fantastic guy. A man that I, I sort of recruited. I'm very proud of him because Thank you. They like that guy. Thank you very much. Thank you. You ever see crowds like this? Is this the greatest? A man that I sort of recruited, uh, a particular congressman voted to impeach me. They're all just about gone now, just about over. They're gone. Whatever happened to Liz Cheney? Where is she? Boy, did she, was that Trump derangement? The, that committee was a rigged deal, but did you ever see anybody like her? She was, she had seriously, she had a massive case of Trump derangement syndrome, didn't she? But a man, uh, he voted to impeach me, and you know, when people vote to impeach, that's sort of the ultimate. You can vote every once in a while against education, you can vote against something, you can vote against uh, tax hikes or tax cuts, you can do a, but when they vote to impeach you, there's nothing you can ever do to recover from that. We're never going to be with them. And this guy, out of the blue, in an area that was plus 28, Trump plus 28, he brilliantly, would, it, would he like to have that vote back? He brilliantly said, no, I vote to impeach Trump for nothing, for, for a perfect phone call. Perfect phone call. He made a call. It has turned out to be a perfect call. You know that. Everybody now says, oh, we shouldn't have never, we should have never done it. Anyway, so I said, who's somebody good to run against them? And they said, well, there's a really popular guy in town who's in politics and doing really well. He's a leader. His name is Russell Fry. I said, ah, ah. And I called him up. And I said, uh, I heard you're doing well. Yes, sir, I am. How would you like to run for Congress? I, I gave him about a one minute. How long did that interview last? About 20 seconds on the phone. I said, well, I hear you great. Why don't you run? And then he had to go and prove his stuff, right? And he really proved himself. And I just appreciate it. Russell, you've been incredible, doing a great job. He wiped that guy out. He actually, at the time, won by the biggest margin in the history of Congress. There has never been somebody that lost a big, because usually if somebody's going to lose that big, a sitting congressperson, they usually drop out before the election. He didn't drop out, only to be surpassed by Liz Cheney. She lost by the biggest. Liz Cheney lost by the biggest margin. So you only had that title for about 11 months, right? <laughs> You've done a great job. Thank you very much. A woman who is uh, extremely shy. Extremely shy. 
but a woman who stands up, and I will tell you, she's a fighter. I know about that. She's a fighter. And when you get her on your side, you're both lucky and smart. And uh, she really has. She's been a real good fighter for us, and she's uh, somebody who's done a very good job. And I'm very honored that she's here, and she's been to a couple of our rallies. And uh, she does. When she sets her sight on something, she's tough. And that's what we want, Nancy Mace. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Great job. Now, a really shy person, a person that — I mean, honestly, she's a good person. She's been with me for so long. She's been with me in good times, in bad times. If times are bad, she'll call me up and say, don't worry about it, sir, you're doing great. And if times are good, she'll call me up twice. But she's a fantastic person. She's a very smart person and very respected in Congress. A lot of people don't know how respected she is. Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's pretty good, huh? That's good. A great person. Another warrior that's with you and uh, very successful, William Timmons. Thank you, William. Been great. And a man who became famous one night during his State of the Union, when he stood up, he said, you lie. You remember? I'm sure nobody remembers that, but I do. He is one of the most incredible people, for a lot of reasons, including the fact that Alan Wilson is his son. Alan Wilson, stand up, and Joe Wilson, stand up. Thank you. Look at that. Look how they get along. Look how. Two great people. Thank you both. Thank you. It's a great family. State Treasurer Curtis Loftus. Curtis, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And somebody that's done an incredible job in North Carolina with all the theft and all the cheating and everything else. In Pennsylvania, I was leading by so many. It was over 73 percent of the vote. And all of a sudden, there was this big dump. Where did it come from? And they said, oh, you're no longer leading. You're tied. And then it went on and on. And it was disgraceful what happened. And likewise, other states. But in North Carolina, that lead never wavered. It just kept going on and on and on. I said, why isn't it happening in North Carolina? Oh, that's right. You have a lot of friends here from North Carolina. Why isn't it happening? And it didn't happen because of his leadership. He was the head of the North Carolina Republican Party. And he's going to be the head of the Republican Party of our whole beautiful Incredible country. He, he, look, he's, he was tough. He was smart. He was strong. He was respected. He understands voter fraud probably better than anybody. Michael Watley, North Carolina. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Great job. I always, I said to Michael, I said, we don't need any votes. All we have to do is guard the vote. You know what guard the vote means. And I don't mean vote early, vote late. I don't mean vote on Tuesday or vote two weeks. That's all fine. I mean, we don't want ballots being dropped that are fake. We call them counterfeit ballots. That's what we don't want. And he'll stop it. Thank you very much, Michael. He's the best guy there is. Very important. That's an important guy. It is true. I told them, don't worry about the votes. We got all the votes. We got so many votes. We have millions more votes than the other side. It's not even close. Just watch that they don't drop ballots. From the very first day that we take back the White House from crooked Joe Biden, I believe we are going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country. In our first term, we appointed over 300 federal judges, a record, and three great Supreme Court justices. Our incredible veterans, what we did for the veterans was, you know, we had a 92 percent approval rating for the vets. Now they're down into the 40s again. They were in the 40s for years, 92, because we passed two things, the VA Accountability Act and VA Choice. Accountability. We fired 9,000 sadists, thieves, crooks, 
wise guys. They hated our veterans. They would beat up our veterans in not prime time. They could never have done it in prime time. But they were sadists. We had 9,000 people. And because of the civil service laws, you couldn't, you couldn't even think about firing them. We had somebody in one of our places that got caught stealing $400,000. Court called. You couldn't fire them. They were protected. We got that done. They've been trying to do it for 52 years, and we got it done. We fired 9,000 people and replaced them with people that love our vets. Right? And the other is choice. Uh, we were having people stand online sometimes for two months, three months, four months. You know, we have great doctors in the VA, but a lot of administration problems they had. And people were going online, not very sick, and by the time they saw a doctor, they became terminally ill. Literally, things that could have been fixed, they became terminally ill. And we did a choice, which they've been trying to do for 52, 53 years. They couldn't get it passed in Congress. And I got it passed in Congress, VA Choice, where if you have to wait more than 24 hours, you go to private doctors in the community. We pay the bill. You get better. And we actually — I mean, I didn't do it for this reason, but we actually saved a lot of money. But we saved a lot of lives. A lot of lives. <laughs> saved a lot of lives. We fully rebuilt the U.S. military and created Space Force, which was a big deal. When I did that, remember, people were smiling. Russia and China were killing us in space, and now we're the, by far the leader in space. That was a big deal. Hadn't been done in 78 years. Last one was Air Force. 78 years. It was a great achievement. And I was the first president in decades who started no new wars. Instead, I brought back our troops. We knocked out ISIS, and we brought back our troops. You do remember, though, we defeated ISIS. We defeated ISIS. I say, let's get home. It's time to bring them home. Hillary Clinton used to say in the debates, look at him, that personality. Look at that person. He's going to get us into a war. No, my personality kept us out of wars. You would have never had Russia go in. You would have never had — you would have never had the problem that you just had, the horrible problem where Israel, October 7, where Israel was so horribly attacked. These things wouldn't have happened because they respected me, but they respected our country. Now they — they laugh at our president. They laugh at him. The guy can't talk. The guy can't walk. Remember when he said, I'd like to take him behind the barn? <laughs> and the fake news — see the fake news? Oh, look at all those guys. The fake news said — I want to take him behind. Remember that? He said, I want to take him behind the barn. Uh, I'm going to take him. And the fake news said, isn't that nice? Oh, that's so cute. That's so cute. It said, he wants to take him behind the barn. In other words, wants to take me behind the barn and go. And the fake news is saying, it's wonderful. Then when I said, let him take me behind the barn, I hit him. So they said, oh, that's terrible. He's a fascist. <laughs> Trump is a fascist. Now, if I ever did, if we were ever behind a barn, I would look at him and I'd go like this. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after we — we, 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 not me — we win the presidency, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled. I will get it settled. People dying by the thousands. Horrible thing. Under the Trump administration, we will return to peace through strength. That's what we had. They respected us all over the world. Three years ago, we had the most secure border in U.S. history. We ended catch and release, built 571 miles of border wall, and got Mexico to send 28,000 soldiers to our border free of charge. You think that was easy to get Mexico to give us 28,000 soldiers free? Free. I got them to give a lot. 
There was no mechanism. Remember, I used to say, we'll get Mexico to pay for a big portion of the wall. Well, this cost them more money than the wall. And it wasn't easy, but I said, if you don't do it, we're going to put tariffs on all your cars. We're going to do numbers on you like you wouldn't believe. Sir, we would love to uh, send you 28,000 free soldiers. <laughs> Under Biden, we now have the worst border in the history of the world. No one has been hurt by this invasion more than our black and Hispanic populations. And also, it's true. No, they're taking your jobs. They're taking your jobs. They're taking your slots on education. Black and Hispanic populations have been hurt more by this travesty where millions of people — the number is really going to be 18 million people by the time this guy gets out of office. And you know who else is being hurt very badly? The unions. The unions are being hurt very badly because you have unions that have justifiably, over the years and years, people have worked there and they're earning good wages, very — sometimes very high wages. People aren't going to be paying three, four, five times when they can have this. Unions are going to be put out of business. So I don't know how a union can support a guy like Joe Biden. You can't support him. First of all, I don't even think he knows that people are coming in. You want to know the truth? The other day he said, oh, we're, we're thinking about doing something about strengthening up our border. It's about time we got like 14 million people have come in. But no, I think that that's all baked in the cake. That's all baked in. It's not uh, that, they, you know, they're actually — they are good, I have to say. They're, they're trying to say, it's the Republicans' fault. You know what they do? Over and over. It's the Republicans' fault. I saw it the other day, first time. Like, Russia, Russia, Russia. The Ru I don't know anything about Russia, other than I charged them for Nord Stream 2, and I stopped their pipeline. The biggest thing they ever had. And then they say, Trump loves Russia. Putin said to me, if you're really — I mean, they say that — I'd hate like hell to have you as an enemy if you're supposed to be a friend of mine, because nobody — I stopped the pipeline, Nord Stream 2, going to take care of Germany and all of Europe. I ended it. And then what happened? Joe Biden comes in, and he approved it. He approved their pipeline, but he closed down the Keystone Pipeline. How do you like that one? And then they say, Trump loves Russia. No, I, I was the worst thing, and the sanctions I put on Russia, I was the worst thing that ever happened. But I did get along with Putin. That's a good thing. You know, getting along with these people is a good thing, not a bad thing. But nobody — we have nuclear powers. They're a nuclear power. We're a nuclear power. The problem is, we're nuclear powers. You have a number of countries that have massive nuclear capability. And we have a man that is unable to understand it or talk to people or know how to talk to people. If you look at his rhetoric before Russia going into Ukraine, you would say he's saying the exact opposite of what he should be saying. The exact opposite of what. And he has done a horrible job. He is the worst president in the history of our country. There has never been a president so bad. You know, uh, just to go off for one second, I never spoke about him that way, because I have too much respect for the office of the President. See, I have great respect for the office of the President. Thank you, darling. But I have great respect for the office of the President. Too much, maybe, when certain people are in there that shouldn't be in there. But I never spoke the way I spoke now. But when I got indicted over nothing, over — actually, if you think about it, over being right, I was right about that. The call to Zelensky was a perfect call. In fact, I respect Zelensky for saying that was an absolutely perfect call. There was no threat. There was no anything. Remember quid pro quo, quid pro quo? They didn't know the tape was the, — the call was taped. Remember when Schiff went out eight times quid pro quo? And then when they heard the tape, he just sort of disappeared for a little while. What a sleazebag that guy is. Shifty Adam Schiff. And he could end up being a senator. This guy is a disgrace. He's a disgrace. But you know what? I never spoke very badly. I never spoke like this. Now I say, but when that happened, and then again I get indicted on something else, and nah, nah, nah. and then I realize I've been indicted more than Alphonse Capone, and I say, oh my God. And other lawsuits, civil lawsuits, all worked out through this, this uh, horrible, horrible group of people.
But when I got indicted, just for the first time, I got indicted, and even the press said, he'll never be indicted. He'll never be indicted over January 6th because he never did it. The press was saying that, and they indicted me. Then I said, okay, well, now I'm allowed to talk the facts. He is the worst and most incompetent and most corrupt president in history. The only one that loves him is Jimmy Carter, because Jimmy Carter's administration, by comparison, looks brilliant. It looks brilliant. Jimmy Carter had a brilliant administration compared to Biden. He's the most corrupt president, the most incompetent president ever. I would never have said that, even though it's true. But out of respect for the office, I would never talk that way. But now I do talk that way. He's a bad guy. He, he weaponized things. And he is a threat to democracy, not us. He is a threat. Thanks to Biden, we now have a new category of crime. It's called migrant crime. I actually added the word by, I call it migrant, migrant. Do you see where they come into New York and they start fistfights with the cops? I've never seen that. You know, I've seen guys, but there's a little respect. We have great people in New York, and these guys actually are fighting them. They're fighting them on the streets. These are tough people that came in. These are people that came in from prisons. They came in from mental institutions from all over the world, from Africa. Yesterday, the Congo was well represented. People coming out of prison from the Congo have come into our country. People coming from, think of it, people coming from all over Asia, from the Middle East, from South America, from Yemen. They come from Yemen. We're bombing Yemen. You know, here we go again with the bombs. Bombs, bombs, bombs. I could solve it all with a phone call, just a phone call, like I did with Macron of France. He was going to put a tax on. My people said, we'll never be able to stop it. I gave him a little chance, just a quick run on the story. Emmanuel Macron, head of France. And I said, uh, get it stopped. They're putting a big tax on our companies. I said, get it stopped. And they came back and they said, we've been unable to do it. I said, I'll do it. And I called up Macron. Emmanuel, how are you? How are you? Oh, Donald, Donald, thank you so much. I am fine. I miss you so much. We must get together. I said, we will. But first, we have to settle. You're putting a tax on our American companies, a very big tax. It's not fair, Emmanuel. Yes, yes, but it has already passed. I am not able to do anything. I said, that's OK. Starting on Monday morning, Every bottle of wine and champagne that comes into the United States is going to have a 100 percent tax or tariff put on it. No, 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 Donald, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. He goes, no way. I said, way. No way, way. And I said, here's the story. Call me back within five minutes. Let me know. He called me back in about two minutes. He said, we've decided not to place this tax on American company. I did so much of that stuff, and I can't — it's so much. And I wish they were all recorded. I wish they were all recorded. I really do, because some of these conversations were classic. You would have seen what a great job we did. But you can do things that — that stupid people can't do. I mean, Biden — Biden doesn't think about — Let's not bump. Look, number one, you're killing a lot of people. On both sides, you're killing a lot of people. Each bomb costs approximately $1 million. Every time you see bomb, bomb, bomb all over the place, they're hitting the middle of the sand, they're all over the place. They don't know what they are. They have no idea what they're doing. It's a million dollars every time you hear a noise. Bing, million, bing, two million, bing, three. It's, a, it's a, such a disgrace. And it was that way when I came into office. Think of it. I got rid of ISIS 100 percent, got rid of the greatest terrorists in the world, Soleimani and al-Baghdadi, the greatest terrorists in the world. And we brought back our troops. We were pulling out of Afghanistan, but we were pulling out with dignity and strength, and we were going to be out. You know, they were there for 20 years. And the leader of the Taliban in Afghanistan, very tough guy, Abdul, I had a conversation because he was killing a lot of our people with sniper fire during the Obama administration, really a lot. They were just shooting them out. And I had a talk. The press went crazy. They said, what are you talking to them for? Why would you be talking to the Taliban? I said, because that's where the problem is. Remember Jesse James, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. It's the same thing.
Why do you rob banks? Jesse, that's where the money is, you stupid fool. But that's where the problem was with the Taliban. And I spoke to him, Abdul, Abdul, so nice to talk to you. Don't kill any more of our people. If you do, you will be met with force the likes of which you have never heard of or seen. You know, that from that point forward, and we had a very good, tough conversation. From that point forward, we didn't have one, and Biden admitted this, and the people actually said, don't admit that. From that point forward, we didn't have one soldier, person shot at or killed for 18 months. For 18 months. And then we had the rigged election. And then they said, we're going to leave. And instead of taking the troops out last, they said, let's take the troops out first. And all hell broke out. And that was the worst. Well, it was a surrender, essentially. We, there was no surrender. They were so afraid of us. They wouldn't do anything. They hated those F-16s that would go over. They hated it. They looked up. They said, get the hell out of here. Now they own the F-16s. You know, they own, they own our military. $85 billion worth of equipment, 13 dead soldiers, 38 soldiers who have been just so badly hurt. No arms, no leg, no legs. The face was just so badly hurt. Nobody's ever seen. Five years ago, you couldn't have saved them. But so, I mean, what they have to live through because of this. And we left a lot of people behind, too, Americans. We left a lot of Americans behind, all because of bad leadership. But if you ask that beautiful, probably five- or six-year-old child right there, would you take the soldiers out first or last? He would say, sir, I would take the soldiers out last. These people took the military out first. And now everybody was defenseless. And I could just see Abdul. They go up to Abdul in his office. Abdul, Abdul, the Americans have left. No, you fool. Of course they have. No, no, Abdul. And I could just see this conversation. And then they send somebody out to check and comes back, says, Abdul, he's right. The American soldiers have left. We were standing defenseless. And we didn't keep Bagram, one of the biggest military bases, one of the biggest, most powerful runways in length and in strength, eight feet deep of concrete. We didn't keep it one hour away. Think of it. One hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons. We didn't keep it. In New York City, our police are being mobbed, brutalized, and horrifically beaten by swarms of migrants who have no business being in our country, yet then they are released back onto the streets while giving our police officers the middle finger. You saw that, right, the other day. These are people that come from countries. I guarantee you they wouldn't do that in their country. They wouldn't do that in their country. I know their countries. You do that in their country, they wouldn't be living for more than five minutes. This month, a savage, illegal alien criminal pulled out a gun and shot a 38-year-old female tourist in the middle of Times Square. He then went on to later shoot a New York Police Department officer near Radio City Music Hall. He was found to have been living in a Biden migrant shelter, by, which, by the way, used to be occupied by veterans. They were all thrown out so that the migrants could get a place to live. What they've done, what they've done to our veterans is unbelievable. Where he also committed armed robbery in the Bronx and then shot someone else before being brutally apprehended. He took tremendous, caused tremendous damage to our police in Chicago. Violent crime arrests of Biden migrants. I have to say that Biden migrants and it's Biden migrant crime have exploded by 11,000 percent, 11,000 percent. That's over a three-year period, 11,000. We have migrant crime. Add that onto the list. And it's among the most, the worst, most heinous crime there is. These are tough people. These are people that have come out of those jails. They've come out of mental institutions. Just last weekend, a band of four illegal alien thugs were arrested in Chicago after they approached a man in a subway car in the middle of the afternoon, robbed him and viciously tried to strangle him. And they also were later tracked down at a 
migrant shelter that used to be occupied by military. On day one, I will seal the border, stop the invasion, and send Joe Biden's illegal aliens back home. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, and we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. We will restore law and order in our country. I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every radical, out-of-control prosecutor for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law. It's horrible what's going on with law enforcement. I'm also going to indemnify all police officers and law enforcement officials throughout the United States to protect them from being destroyed by the radical left for taking strong actions on crime. And we are going to rebuild our cities into beacons of hope, safety, and beauty better than they have ever been before. We will take over the horribly run capital of our nation, Washington, D.C., and clean it up, renovate it, and rebuild our capital city. Though, Have you seen what's been happening? Have you seen people being murdered? They come from South Carolina to go for a nice visit, and they end up being murdered, shot, mugged, beat up. Those beautiful marble columns have graffiti. The roads are broken. The medians between the roads are falling into the street. You can imagine what foreign dignitaries and people from foreign countries say. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content onto our children. And I will not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or mask mandate. And something I find hard to believe that I even have to say, I will keep men out of women's sports. And I will fully uphold the Second Amendment. We will protect innocent life. And we will restore free speech. So importantly, we have to secure our elections. Our goal will be one-day voting with paper ballots and voter ID. But until then, Republicans must win elections. If you took the 10 worst presidents in the history of the United States and added them up, they would not have done near the destruction to our country as Joe Biden and the Biden administration has done. So if you want to save America, then you must go and vote, right? You're going to vote? Remember, the primary is tomorrow, Saturday, February 24th. It's a very big one. The whole world is watching. We have to show big numbers. You have to get out and vote. We're going to win it. We're going to win it big. We have to win it by margins never seen before. Bring everyone that you know. Details are, if you want, sc.donaldjtrump.com. They'll give you any information you want. So in conclusion, together we are taking on some of the most menacing forces and vicious opponents our people have ever seen. But no matter how hateful and corrupt the communists and criminals we're fighting are, you must never forget, this nation does not belong to them. This nation belongs to you. This is your home. This is your heritage. And our American liberty is your God-given right. So from Columbia to Clemson, from Greenville to Charleston, from Myrtle Beach to Rock Hill, we stand on the shoulders of South Carolina heroes who crossed the ocean, settled the continent, tamed the wilderness, and laid down the railroads, 
raised up those great skyscrapers, won two world wars, defeated fascism and communism, and made America the single greatest nation in the history of the world. But now, we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has the highest inflation in 50 years, where banks are collapsing and interest rates are skyrocketing. Likewise, we are a nation where energy costs have reached the highest levels in our history. We are no longer energy independent or energy dominant as we were just a few short years ago. We are a nation that is begging Venezuela for oil. Please, please, please help us, Joe Biden says. Yet we have more liquid gold under our feet than any other nation anywhere in the world. We are a nation that just recently heard that Saudi Arabia and Russia will be reducing their oil production, while at the same time substantially increasing the price and we met that threat by announcing that we will no longer be drilling for oil in large areas of Alaska and elsewhere on our beautiful lands. We are a nation that is consumed by the radical left's Green New Deal, yet everyone knows that the Green New Scam is fake and will lead to our destruction. We are a nation whose leaders are demanding all electric cars, despite the fact that they don't go far, cost too much, and whose batteries are produced in China with materials only available in China when an unlimited amount of gasoline is available inexpensively in the United States, but not available in China. And now we are a nation that wants to make our revered and very powerful army tanks the best anywhere in the world, all electric, so that despite the fact that they are also not able to go far, Fewer pollutants will be released into the air as we blast our way through enemy territory in an environmentally friendly way. And they also want to make our fighter jets with a green stamp of energy savings, though losing 15% efficiency, but allowing us to keep our enemy's atmosphere clean of emissions as we viciously and unceremoniously attack them at levels never seen before. Who are these people that would do this to us? We are these people. We are these people. We are being led by fools. We are being led by stupid, stupid representatives. And we cannot allow it to continue. We are a nation that ended oil exploration and production in the United States, just as the price of oil reached an all-time high. What other countries would do such a foolish and self-destructive thing? Who would do this to us? Who are these leaders? Who are these fools? Can we be energy independent and even dominant again? Yes, oh yes, and quickly, says President Trump. Yes, oh yes, and very quickly. We are a nation that surrendered in Afghanistan, leaving dead soldiers, American citizens, and $85 billion worth of the finest military equipment in the world, and also abandoning Bagram, one of the biggest military bases, only one hour away from where China makes those vicious and hateful nuclear weapons. We are a nation that allowed Russia and Ukraine to fight, killing hundreds of thousands of people, and it will only get worse. It would never have happened with me as your president, and for four straight years, it didn't happen. Likewise, the horrifying attack on Israel would never have happened. They wouldn't even have thought of doing such a thing if President Trump was in the Oval Office. 
Iran was broke under the Trump administration. Iran was broke. They didn't have the money to fund Hamas, Hezbollah, and all of the other instruments of terror. But those sanctions were lifted by a corrupt Biden administration. And now Iran is a rich country again with $200 billion and another $6 billion for hostages and $10 billion for electricity to Iraq. All compliments of the incompetent Biden administration. And China with Taiwan is next. We are a nation that allows radical left terrorists to violently attack our cities, leaving behind massive destruction and death. And nothing happens to the criminals that do these terrible things. There is no punishment. But when people who love our country protest on January 6th in Washington, they become hostages unfairly imprisoned for long periods of time. We are a third world nation that has weaponized its law enforcement against the opposing political party like never, ever before. We've got a federal bureau of investigation that won't allow bad election changing facts to be presented to the public and which offers $1 million to a writer of fiction about Donald Trump to lie and say it was fact where Hunter Biden's laptop from hell was Russian disinformation and the FBI knew it wasn't. But 51 intelligence agents said it was and a Department of Justice that refuses to investigate egregious acts of voting irregularities and frauds. And we have a man who is totally corrupt and the worst president in the history of our country who is cognitively impaired and in no condition to lead and is now in charge of dealing with Russia and possible nuclear war, which would be World War III and far more devastating than any of the previous world wars because of the weaponry that no one even wants to talk about or to think about. We are a nation that no longer has a free and fair press. Fake news is all you get, and they are indeed the enemy of the people. They refuse, as everybody knows, to even discuss the Biden crime family, but enjoy covering the false indictments of Donald J. Trump, who has done nothing wrong except win an election that was supposedly unwinnable. We are a nation where free speech is no longer allowed, where crime is rampant and out of control like never before. We are a nation that is allowing Iran to build a massive nuclear weapon and China to use the trillions and trillions of dollars it has taken from us to build a military to rival our own. And less than three years ago, we had Iran, China, Russia, and North Korea in check. They respected us. They were afraid of us. They weren't going to do a thing against us, and everyone knows it. Now Russia and China are holding summits to carve up the rest of the world. And perhaps most importantly, we are a nation that is no longer admired, respected, or listened to on the world stage. They are no longer respected. Nobody wants to listen. We are a nation that in many ways has become a joke. And we are a nation that is hostile to liberty, freedom, faith, and even hostile to God. We are a nation whose economy is collapsing into a cesspool of ruin, whose supply chain is broken, whose stores are not stocked, whose deliveries are not coming, and whose educational system is ranked at the very bottom of every single list. We are a nation that just sold a once great company, United States Steel, to Japan. And we are a nation whose stock markets continue success is totally contingent on MAGA winning the next election. We are a nation where large packs of sadistic criminals and thieves are allowed to go into stores and openly rob them. 
beat up and kill their workers and customers and leave with armloads of goods, but with no retribution where the authority of our great police has been taken, where their families and pensions have been threatened, and their lives would be destroyed for the mere mention of the words law enforcement. We are a nation where fentanyl and other forms of illegal drugs are easier to get than groceries to feed our beautiful families. We have become a drug-infested nation, crime-ridden nation, which is incapable of solving even the smallest and simplest of problems. We can't solve anything. We will institute the powerful death penalty for drug dealers, where each dealer is responsible for the death during their lives of 500 people or more. Mothers will never again be forced to watch their children overdosing and hopelessly dying in their arms, screaming, what can I do? What can I do? My child is dying. We are a nation whose once revered airports are dirty. They're a crowded mess. You sit and wait for hours and then are notified that the plane won't leave and that they have no idea when it will. Where ticket prices have tripled, they don't have the pilots to fly the planes. They don't see qualified air traffic controllers, and they just don't know what the hell they're doing. We are a nation that screens its citizens viciously at all ports, but if you're an illegal alien, you're allowed to flow through by the millions and millions and millions. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, willpower, and strength. We are a nation that has lost its way but we are not going to allow this horror to continue any longer. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. It was the hardworking patriots like you who built this country, and it's the hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. We will fight for America like no one has ever fought before. 2024 is our final battle. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. And we will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. We will rout the fake news media. We will drain the swamp and we will liberate our country from these tyrants and villains once and for all. Like those patriots before us, we will not bend, we will not break, we will not yield, we will never give in, we will never give up, we will never ever back down with your support. We will go on to victory, the likes of which no one has ever seen before. We will evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House, and we will take back our country on November 5th, 2024. The great silent majority is rising like never before, and under our leadership, the forgotten man and woman will be forgotten no longer. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. We are a movement the likes of which this country and perhaps the world has never seen before. There has never been anything like this. And together we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much, South Carolina. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.